Well, uh, let's get started again. Um, so where we left off is that you know I argued is that you know, due to the fact that basically atoms take a a very long time to spontaneously emit a photon, you know unless you create a, a Bose-Einstein constant that's the size of this room, uh, this Markovian approximation uh, is always very good. Okay. Um, so the end result of that is that you know for practical uh, purposes, we can then ignore this kind of time retardation. Uh, so we, we formally integrate out of the fields. Uh, then formally what you get is that one atom, uh, its evolution depends on atoms at previous times, physically because you know, there's a speed of light uh, that takes for one atom, the photon coming from one atom to hit another atom. Um, but then kind of for reasonable system sizes, uh, you can ignore that time retardation. And now this differential equation for the atoms becomes time local. Um, so it's a set of equations uh, that, you know, unless you really work with quantum optics, it looks very kind of abstract, actually. Um, but then you might just kind of ask, uh, okay, here I have Heisenberg equations of motion, so I didn't formally derive the master equation. Um, but then you might ask kind of, uh, on one hand, you might try to guess what master equation Uh, is consistent with these equations of motion. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you don't like this idea of guessing, you can uh, actually go and derive the master equation uh, more formally. Uh, using a pretty paradigmatic uh, technique, in, at least in quantum optics, which is called uh, the Born-Markov approximation. Um, so this is actually uh, what I'll leave as uh, the exercise. Um, so I've created uh, uh, a couple of pages of, of notes, which you can find on the school webpage, uh, where I basically kind of like step you through exactly what is the born markov calculation. And then you, know, uh, you can just kind of check for yourself that if you go through the steps, uh, you, you get the the final claimed result. So um, in either case, either by guessing or by doing this full derivation, um, what you get is that the corresponding master equation, once everything becomes local in time, so this is an equation uh, for the atoms alone, because we've integrated out the photons, is minus I H effective rho minus rho h effective dagger. Um, and it turns out there's only one Jampf operator uh, for the chiral waveguide. So there's a single C uh, where the effective Hamiltonian uh, contains uh, some kind of you know, driving term. So this represents the fact that, you know, again, you can always send in a field from the outside. Um, and then there's a corresponding term for the atoms that you know, can drive. That, that will be kind of arbitrary for now. Um, but then the important thing is that you know, when you integrate out the field, you get the atoms uh, interact with other atoms physically through you know, photon absorption and emission. Okay. Um, so besides this kind of input term, you'll get Um, this kind of self term. Okay, so if you only had one atom, uh, then this term describes exponential spontaneous emission. So this is you know spontaneous emission of just one atom. And then you'll get one term. Uh, another term uh, coming from these scattered fields. Okay. 
Uh, so that particular term looks something like this. Okay. Uh, so basically, what it says is that if atom j is to the left of atom i, then atom j can lower itself, uh, go from the excited state to the ground state, and then atom i can go from the ground state to the excited state, physically because atom j, of course, emitted a photon and atom i uh, absorbed it. Okay. And then uh, the single jump operator of the system is given by the superposition of all the lowering operators of all the atoms. Okay. So um, at the same time, uh, you know, we also have this input-output equation. So you know, uh, we integrated out the field, but it's an exact expression. Right? So we have this uh, expression that the total field at any point in time is the field uh, that I send in. Um, And so um, just as we Im invoked this kind of Markovian approximation for the atoms, we can invoke it for the field as well. So we, we got rid of the fact that, in principle, the field as an observation point uh, depends on the atoms at a previous point in time. So self-consistently, you know, uh, we can also ignore that retardation. And uh, you know, so er more or less everything I set up to now was just to arrive at these two equations. So let's do a bit of a reset. Even if you didn't understand completely what, uh, you know, everything I set up to now, you can somehow kind of reset. Uh, my goal was just to show that, you know, atom-light interactions are formally and exactly encoded in these two equations here. Oh yeah, right, so the, the reason is, um, so imagine that this was not imaginary, imagine that was just a real number instead. So then a term omega times sigma EE times excited state population, that just physically describes uh, that the excited state population, or the, sorry, the excited state has some energy, omega, you know, relative to the ground state, which we did find to be zero. So this number here basically the fact that it's imaginary means I have an imaginary energy associated with uh, the excited state, and an imaginary energy is exactly the same as a decay rate. So that's why it depends on population rather than coherence. Um, so, um, if we think about what we've done, you know, it, it actually seems kind of remarkable, right? Because a priori, um, you think about atom-light interactions as a kind of non-equilibrium quantum field theory, right? Because I have a field degree of freedom. And what I'm saying is that, you know, you can formally forget about a quantum field theory, which is, you know, actually very hard to solve in general. Um, the full problem of atom-light interactions is fully encoded in these two equations. And the way to think about it is the following. So, you know, how you kind of use these equations in practice is the following. Um, so first, imagine that I could solve the dynamics of just the atoms alone under this master equation or under this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Okay, so I'm solving formally a possibly driven uh, a spin system with both coherent interactions and collective dissipation. Um, when I say collective dissipation, what I mean is that I have this term in the dissipation that's not just a kind of uh, sum of single particle terms, 
So if I only had, had this term here, that would be like each atom emits independently a fixed rate gamma 1D. The fact that I have this kind of uh, product of operators means that my dissipation actually depends on correlations or physically wave interference between the, the spins or between the atoms. Okay? So provided that I can solve the dynamics of this spin system, then I can, in principle, go and calculate any spin correlation functions that I want. And now if I want to kind of find uh, the properties of any field that's emitted by the system, I would then go and, and apply this equation here. So for example, imagine I was interested in calculating the expectation value of A, the total field A itself. So then as long as I know the, total, the, the field that I send in, which of course I, I should know, and as long as I can calculate the correlation function of the atoms, I can go and reconstruct the total field or any of its correlation functions for free. So again, the total field is not a true independent degree of freedom. Um, it just all depends on what the atoms are doing. Okay, so that's kind of a weird statement. Quantum optics is nothing more than some strange condensed matter spin model. Right? Um, so of course that's easy to say. Then the question is, you know, can you actually go and solve the spin model? Is it any easier to solve than a non-equilibrium field theory? So of course, you know, spin systems in general uh, uh, are probably also very hard to solve. Um, but the hope is that this formulation at least leads you, you know, maybe to some simplifications and some limits or some new insights that you would not gain from the, the quantum field theory point of view. Okay, so the goal of the lecture is going forward is to really explore you know, what are the consequences of, of writing it this way and what can we actually deduce from the spin model. Okay, so um, let me now actually kind of rewrite um, this spin model in slightly different form. So again, remember that you know, to, to get to this model here, I basically assumed that my resonance frequency of the atoms was defined to be zero. So, okay, so I have this kind of chiral waveguide dispersion, omega of k. I assume that my, dis, my, my atomic uh, resonance frequency intersected at, at zero energy. Um, now let me kind of redo the, the, so let me just kind of claim what the answer is. Um, if I were to really put back in like a kind of physical resonance frequency. So if I had repeated exactly the same uh, calculation. Uh, so putting back you know, omega naught, or basically the fact that you know, when I go from the ground state to the excited state, you know, there's a resonance frequency of omega naught. Um, then it turns out that uh, the effect of Hamiltonian uh, becomes the following. So if I also put back kind of the speed of light, not let it be one, um, okay, so um, these would be your new equations. Um, then the question is, what is this uh, mysterious object G? that I just put in here. Um, it turns out that G is the electromagnetic Green's function. So it's an object that's derived within classical uh, electromagnetism. And physically what it describes is uh, if you have, so G of you know, R and R prime, at omega naught, 
um, what this quantity kind of physically corresponds to is if I have some kind of uh, oscillating uh, point dipole, e to the omega t, at position r prime. This Green's function asks what is the field at some observation point r coming from this radiating dipole. Um, and then for, for 1D, it's kind of pretty easy to guess what this Green's function should be. Um, so in chiral waveguide QED, uh, the Green's function uh, would be proportional to a step function. That's because the oscillating source only emits the field to the right. And then in 1D, if you have a kind of uh, a source that oscillates at a fixed frequency, um, it's simply going to emit a plane wave, okay? where this k naught is omega over c. So it's just the kind of free phase uh, that uh, that a field picks up as it propagates some distance z minus z prime. Okay. So relating to what I had before. Um, you know, before I, I said that omega naught was zero, okay, so then I pick up no phase as I propagate. So this term disappears, and then this step function here exactly reproduces this effective Hamiltonian here. Okay. Um, so one reason I presenting this kind of chiral waveguide model is because it's a simple enough system where you actually kind of can derive this from first principles, okay? But my claim is that, you know, the physics of this should be quite general. So the, the facts, so, so in other words, what this Hamiltonian says is that when I have photons, you know, can I, I can have a process where one atom de-excites and another one excites where the amplitude of that interaction depends on how a photon or how a field propagates from one atom to another. So you might guess that this equation, this set of equations, is true in general. So it could be true in 3D for a bidirectional waveguide, et cetera. The only thing you have to change is you have to put in the correct Green's function for that electromagnetic environment. Um, so to prove it is actually uh, quite subtle, um, which is why I presented just by example from the chiral waveguide. Um, but then the claim is that it's completely general. Uh, and you just have to put in the correct Green's function for the, you know, whatever number of dimensions you live in. Okay. Um, so that's the kind of main message that um, even though I only talked about the chiral waveguide, um, we can all of a sudden jump to free space if we want, and then we just have to put in the, you know, solution to the wave equation in free space. And these equations, uh, this so-called spin model formalism, still works. Right. Uh, any questions on that? So, like, right, like very broadly, what happens if your environment is not free space, but you have some resonance with some cavity modes or stuff like that, so, and you're close to that? Right. So um, again, this is completely general, provided that the Markovian approximation holds. So in free space, you know, there's really, really only one length scale, which is you, know, you have some physical distance between atoms, light passes from one point to the next and then disappears. So in a cavity, um, the Markovian nature is set by how many round trips the photon can make uh, between the mirrors. And so that sets a new kind of more stringent time that defines whether the system is Markovian or not. So for example, if you're in this so-called strong coupling regime of 
cavity QED, where you can really see kind of like Rabi oscillations where an, a single atom emits a photon then reabsorbs it, that you can't possibly capture from an atomic uh, uh, master equation, because this type of master equation only allows for monotonic decay of excited state population. Yeah, so, so if you have something like a cavity with a very narrow bandwidth to begin with, you can break down the Markovian approximation, but if you don't, this is, sorry, this is still true, and you just have to put in the Green's function of a cavity. So can I think about like separating the, the, the interaction with the cavity and with the rest of the environment? So like, other Oh, yes, yeah, so that, that's possible as well. So if you have one discrete mode that really sees strong coupling, you can try to separate that out from the rest of the Green's function. Um, so, so that perfectly works. Um, no, so I think the chirality is pretty specific to these types of nanoscale systems where you have very big, very strong evanescent fields. So in, in free space, um, uh, this kind of chirality disappears. No. Uh, you just told us that the 1D chiral waveguide model is integrable, meaning that it has factorizing stuff, S matrix and so on. Yeah, this, this model, effective model in one dimension is also integrable, the spin model one? Um, yes, so, right, so, so this model here is also integrable. Um, but again, it's the same story, it's not as good as it sounds um, in real life. Okay, so, um, uh, again, the, the, the main point of the Cairo waveguide was just to kind of illustrate that this general form of equations, you know, there's a way to derive it that, you know, to p give some plausibility and some intuition of where these equations come from. But at this point, you can kind of do a clean reset in your head if you want. You can just kind of accept by fiat that this is true. And uh, starting in the next lecture, uh, we'll explore the consequences in a more natural system, which is just atoms in, in free space. Um, and then, uh, so it took a little bit longer to arrive here uh, than I thought, but now the idea was to switch to this kind of exercise uh, session. So um, I think in the uh, uh, website of the school, if you look at the kind of uh, the lectures, um, it was, uh, there was uploaded uh, basically a two-page document that essentially kind of takes you through the main steps uh, to uh, sorry, so to, to derive you know this effective Hamiltonian with this particular Green's function, kind of from first principles using the Born-Markov approximation. So it's not you know central to the to the to the rest of the lectures because again we can just kind of accept by fiat that this is true. But I thought it'd be nice you know for you to, to give it a shot and see if you can really derive it. Um, again, the Born-Markov calculation is nice because it's a paradigmatic technique in, in quantum optics. Um, so my thought was that uh, you guys can just try to you know, give it a shot. Um, maybe you guys want to actually divide into groups and discuss the calculation uh, along the way. That's totally fine. Um, so maybe we can take you know, the rest of the hour to, that you guys figure out, try to figure out on your own. If you have any questions, I'll be here. You can feel free to ask me. And then uh, starting my next lecture, since the, this discussion went a little bit over time, maybe at the beginning of lex lecture, we can also continue this exercise session, and I can also discuss the solution of the problem. And then we'll continue on with the lectures. So um, that's the, the plan. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So uh, when you write down the Limbrad equation, it's fine to compute uh, single time, uh, so one point function, so expectation values. But when you have to generalize to multi-time correlation functions, so you know that there is some kind of discussion now as whether it's you can actually do it uh, with, the, with the density matrix and you don't have to. Uh, right. There is some sort of, uh, like, uh, if you can expand on that, if it's possible to actually yes. calculate two-point function, three-point functions. Yeah, it, it's totally possible. So once you get it into this kind of uh, Lindblad form, 
uh, we won't use it. We won't explicitly do it in in these lectures. But then it becomes a standard quantum optics calculation. So there's a technique known as um, uh, uh, quantum regression theorem, okay. which basically is a, just a it's a well-defined procedure of how you can calculate two-time correlations given this density matrix structure. Um, one way you can do it kind of heuristically is you can always go back to the Schrodinger picture. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar in quantum optics with this so-called G2 function, where you say you detect a photon at time zero, and then what's the conditional probability you detect a photon at later time? So the way you would do that in practice in the Schrodinger picture is say, I evolve my state up to time zero. I now apply the photon annihilation operator on it. I get a new state. And then I'm going to continue evolving that in the Schrodinger picture until a second time t prime and calculate what's the probability the photon is emitted then. So, so it's straightforward to do it within this Lindblad form. Yeah. Okay, so um, if there's no more questions, again, you know, I suggest that maybe you guys get into small groups and you know, try. Sure. Um, Actually, do you know where it's uploaded? Yeah, so it's not that simple to share on the whole screen, but. Just one dimension, right? In uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. I don't. Yeah, so only this one. 